Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Fagan Maradian in Renton, Washington, where we are at the world's smallest but soon to be the busiest uh, airplane pro commercial airplane production line at Boeing Commercial Airplanes. Full disclosure, Boeing is one of our sponsors, and we're talking to Marty Chamberlain, the Vice President of Operations here at Boeing Commercial Airplanes for the 737 line. Uh, you've got to be one of the busiest people in the commercial airplane business. It's, it's a fun job, Vago. Thanks for uh, having me today. Uh, that's right. Well, thanks very much for, for hosting us. And what you guys are doing here is uh, extraordinary, right? If you ask most people uh, how many 737s are being produced historically, you know, around 22 was was a, was a high number for you guys, uh, but at this facility, you're going to be pumping out 42 airplanes a year starting next year, we're, I think. Or you're, you're, or you're already at 42. We're at 42 now. You're at 42 yeah. now. You're going to be going to 47 to 52 to 57. Yep. Uh, if you add up the new generation airplane, which is no longer that new generation, right. but then also the Max. Talk to us a little bit about all the work that you guys are doing here. What happens here in Renton to make uh, these airplanes a reality? The, as you said, the facilities pretty small comparatively speaking for aerospace terms and it's really been built for us it's been around Kaizen. It started when we moved the line and get, got people to, engaged about how do we keep things uh, more aggressive for our, um, our competition. We knew that was going to be big with Airbus and at the time we didn't have so much with Embraer or Bombardier or Comac, Sukhoi. But today, that's one of the things that keeps our team very engaged, is knowing that that competition is coming up from the bottom. And that is one of the things that stimulates the team to continue to improve, the Kaizen activity. And, and, and just to say, tell, tell our audience, right, Kaizen is the continuous improvement philosophy, uh, was a U.S. philosophy. Japan then grabbed it, refined yep. it yep. with Shingo and everything else to make sure that you get the ultimate in lean manufacturing. Right. How does that manifest itself at this facility? So we are engaging the teams at every level. The, the crews really have a significant part to play with improving the process. Uh, every morning the teams meet and talk about whether they're going to influence safety or cost or quality aspects of the things that they do and the things that they're responsible for. And that way they can talk about them, improve upon them, build on that, and then come back tomorrow and see how they did and what they need to do differently. When it comes to rate, obviously, you know, you guys, again, you have 737 new generation, the MAX, the P8 that are all happening here at this line. Um, and you're dependent on suppliers from all over oh, the yeah. planet. Yeah. What are the keys to making sure that you don't end up choking, you know, because this is a sausage factory ultimately, uh, you know, high quality <laughs> sausages, but a sausage factory Thanks, nonetheless. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, hey, look, the airplane is the casing and you're stuffing it with all of the things that every one of these airplanes is different on what the customer wants. What are the keys to making sure that you guys are delivering at a rate and not eating costs later on in this with rework or anything else? Yeah, it, uh, to coin the phrase, it, it does take a village. I mean, it's really ensuring that the whole value stream is hitting on all cylinders. We've got a, a huge organization that helps us monitor how we're doing. The least uh, part perturbation in the system can cause major disruption. It can be a very small part that will cause chaos in our system. So having that infrastructure around to monitor the supply base, making sure that they are on time, whether it's the small brackets or wire bundles all the way to seats and galleys and engines. So it's making sure that all of that is on time and then our team is here poised and does a great job of rolling uh, two out every day now and going up in rate next year and the year after that. Um, one of the big things in the 90s and as we went into the 2000s was a lot of just-in-time delivery. Uh, Boeing adopted that as well. You guys went from stockpiling and warehouses full of, full of stuff that you were the OEM, you were the integrator on for a lot of things. And then you guys transitioned into using much more sub-assemblies that came from uh, 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 you know, various different tiers of the industry. As you're moving into this future and at the rates that you guys are operating at, is it changing the dynamic because in some places you're trying to get a little bit more vertical integration to get a little more elasticity into the system. How is that changing? You know, are you stockpiling more stuff? Because if you look at the pace with which airplanes are moving, I want to get to that on this line, it would appear to me that you guys can't really wait for things to appear at specific times, that you need to actually have greater storage capability. Oh, we're, we're trying to do just the opposite, really. We really are going to just in time. Um, this is a small facility. We don't and you can see behind me, um, we've, we've gone vertical to take advantage of the things that we need to have space for, and part storage is not one of them. We need it for production activity. So uh, we really are working hard with the, the 
uh, trucking industry, for example, to make sure that we have very discreet delivery schedules so that uh, we know the hour that they're late kind of thing or that they can't come in two days early because we don't have space for uh, three or four ship sets worth of seats or galleys kind of thing. We just, we just can't afford that. So we are uh, working very hard to continue to ratchet up uh, the just-in-time philosophy. When, when you're looking at this, and, and walk us through what we're looking at here, because you guys developed a two-tier tool. I mean, I, I think that for our audience who's watching this, this is a double-decker facility. This used to all be a single-floor yep. facility, yep. but that is a tool. Walk us through what's happening on the top of that, what's happening at the bottom, and how quickly an airplane is cycling through this space from something that comes in from Spirit Aviation in Wichita yep. that make the fuselage barrels and something that is coming into an airplane and going out the door here. So uh, the, the tool is relatively new, again, because we needed to have room for increased rates. We needed some flexibility with the MAX and making sure that uh, it's not going to go through the factory at the same speed as the NG is. So we needed to have some space for that. So we created its own separate line, not to disrupt uh, the mechanism that's churning out all of the NGs today. So this tool, we built to consolidate some of our space. There's storage uh, on the bottom. Uh, there's feeder lines with engines and empennages and vertical fins. But then on the top, you have basically storage or the ability to have nine fuselages up there. And every day that line will move one position more to feed the production lines that we have in this assembly hall and the one next door. And how quickly does the fuselage barrel come in and then the sausage go out? Well, one, it's, it's two every day. So two will come in what we refer to as the back door and load into this tool. And then one will roll off of this line and then there's a corresponding other line in the other hall that it rolls off that line as well. So it's clockwork, two in, two out every day. And and it takes about eight days for it to make the whole loop? About, yes. And you guys are working how many shifts? Roughly 24 hours a day, right? Well, if you include all of the support functions and everything we else. We do, we work around the clock. Uh, the, the main production uh, parts of our process are really on two shifts. So we really put about 16 hours a day into every one of these positions. On third shift, we're doing some very unique functions like pressurizing the airplane. We put on uh, some uh, coating on the top of the fuel cell that we don't want people to be around. So there are some unique processes on third, but most of it is moving the line, recycling it, getting uh, the whole operation set up for the very next day so that we can hit the floor at 6 o'clock in the morning running. As you said, this is a you know a very, very small facility and you guys have a lot of throughput going through here of multiple different airplanes, like three different airplanes, although the P-8 is a much smaller piece of it. Um, tell us what the differences are because the DNA of the 737 extends, obviously, the 1960s. It's the world's most populous uh, single aisle airplane. Um, you know, more are in the air than some airplanes. You know, more at any moment are in the air than there are of an entire yeah. other, other type of aircraft. Uh, and I think that some ultimately you guys are trying to shoot down your own record of the of the of the C-47 DC-3 family, which is like I guess still the record holder for nearly about 11,000 airplanes. But you know, walk us through the differences between the new generation airplane and then the Max, and how these two airplanes you know share similarities, obviously common DNA, but are also very different as they're moving down the line ultimately. So the the NG is a, a tried and true product for us from the from the 90s. And so we've got that airplane running on two separate production lines and, and we wanted to isolate the MAX because the MAX was a new product. It had new engines, new strut, uh, new nose landing gear. It had a new flight deck and it has some other um, aerodynamic features on it. So it was enough of a change that we wanted to isolate that away from this production system that's producing one every day off of each one of the lines. And so although much of the wing is the same, the fuselage is the same, the interiors are the same, there was enough wiring and systems changes that we didn't want to disrupt the, the mechanism that was producing the other 41 airplanes a month kind of thing. So we, we isolated that, built its own production line for that. Uh, and introduce the, the things that I mentioned, like new engines, struts, landing gear, and flight deck. Uh, how long, and, and what are the differences in the P-8, right? Because obviously here you're actually almost, you know, all you're doing is sort of final integration checkout, but it's yeah. leaving here with labs, seats, galleys, 
beautiful Starlight interiors if you want that on the on the product, but it's going out here and it's basically flying and being delivered to the customer. Right. What about on the P8 side of things? It's a little bit of a different sort of a setup that you have. Yeah, it is. So we build the commercial uh, side of the P8 product here in this in this facility, and really what it is is it has it has none of the uh, flight crew uh, main deck instruments that. Uh, the P8 uses for sub chasing. So we build, basically we build an airframe. We build a sort of a BBJ, no interiors, the flight deck. The airplane flies uh, everything in except for the interior essentially. Some of the other classified information or classified equipment doesn't go on here, but as much commercial application as we can put on it, we put on it here and there's no tearing apart in the old days we used to do that uh, to modify airplanes for the government we restructure reskin uh, redo a lot of the airplane none of that happens it's mainly uh, classified equipment that gets installed outside of our production facility so so just to be clear on the p8 we do install the sidewalls and the carpeting and those kinds of things and what I was really referring to is that the mission equipment the consoles and those kinds of things we don't install here right um... You know, we, when we were talking a little bit earlier, you know, you were talking about engaging the workforce and Kaizen and yeah. bringing everybody yeah. in in terms of thinking creatively to solve solve problems. Yeah. What are some of the, you know, so you gave me some some great examples. Some of them people already know. You know, you were the 757 program manager as well. Talk to us a little bit about uh, some of the some of the lessons and how the folks here on this production floor, some of whom are fourth, fifth generation Boeingites, yeah. Yeah. are are working and bringing ideas and innovations that are making your life easier. Yeah. One, so one of the ones that is uh, has the most, I'll say, colorful history for us is is what we refer to as the hay baler, and we talked about that earlier. Uh, on the 757 uh, years ago, um, we had we were in, involved in involving our team with the the DNA, getting them to think creatively. And my my catchphrase was really to do it without any money, to to really think creatively, but don't answer our problems with money and 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 solve it that way, but be more creative. And so one of the um, examples was part of our team was over uh, hunting in eastern Washington and we were thinking about how do we uh, make the interior installations more efficient on this moving line application and the guys were thinking about it and came up with a hay baler and we ultimately ended up actually buying a hay baler, modifying it and uh, having that help us uh, raise seats into the airplane and uh, get them out onto the airplane very efficiently and effectively. And we're using that same application on the 37 here today, every day loading seats. So that's one of the examples. Another example is uh, we challenged the team as we were moving and making space for the Max and the other assembly hall. Uh, it was a very large superstructure. And so we challenged them to put things on wheels. That's the way we like things to keep them mobile and if we want to change locations or applications, it's all very modular. And so with that, we put the, the engine buildup team on dollies basically and that's how our engines are assembled today is in an assembly line all on wheels that used to be not too terribly long ago, this very large superstructure that was hanging engines and on a moving line. So great differences in our application and continued DNA or uh, growth in Kaizen. Um, and, and one of the things obviously with the 757 was it was such a tall airplane yeah. that getting the seats up there also was kind of a, a little bit of a, of, of a pain, yeah. uh, a challenge. Yeah. That's right, that's right. Uh, um, you know, you've been in this business for literally decades. Um, what are the keys and how has production evolved in your career and what do you see as the next sort of big innovations? You know, uh, from whether it was slant, uh, different bays, you know, th this configuration is a little bit different from how, you know, walk us through how production in this facility, which really dates to the 1940s, right, with yep. B-17 production yep. and B-29 production, has evolved over the decades that you've worked here. Well, I, th I think we have, uh, over time, we've gone away from the power of our team. And through the 70s and 80s, when I was, much younger and, and new around here, um, it was more around the muscle of our uh, employees rather than the brains. And I, I think we're getting back to that. We're, we're, we're drawing from them the ideas that they are using every day uh, to improve the product. 
we've also built this uh, facility to uh, house our engineers. So the engineers are right here. They're coupled with our mechanics so that when we have problems, they can link together and solve issues quickly. But then to also Kaizen, we have all of the team that we need right here and get them into a conference room for a couple of hours, think through the problem that we have or the issue that we want to resolve. And that's how we are uh, challenging our team with more than just the muscle of the old days. Now we're challenging them for their minds and hopefully their hearts. Um, you said that uh, obviously there was the benefit of an, a regional earthquake that allowed you guys to sort of consolidate and put the engineers yeah. here. But you said that they also didn't like the idea of firemen's poles, which you wanted to install. I, wa I wanted the firemen's poles to get the engineers down on the factory floor quickly. They didn't like that idea very much, but I thought it was, I thought it was good. Um, how quickly can you guys, based on the customer or somebody on the floor who's proposing a change, how quickly can you get that on the assembly line? Well, it obviously depends on the complexity. I mean, if we if we have uh, a straightforward change, I mean, it is uh, a matter of hours where we can write our uh, compliance documents and get them on the factory floor, and if parts are available, we can have that installation rather quickly. If you want a KU band on your airplane and we're in the middle of assembly, it, it takes a little bit longer, of course, but we are becoming more and more nimble, and that's one of the things that we measure, is how are we doing in, in answering our customers' demands, So, and how quickly we do that. Um, obviously, the Pentagon is always looking for acquisition reforms. You know, we obviously cover the Pentagon much more closely than we cover commercial airspace, but we're going to be ramping that coverage up as well. What are some of the lessons that you've learned over the time that you've done this that are also applicable? You know, Leanne Corrette, who's the head of uh, Boeing uh, Defense Security and Space, uh, talked to us a little bit and said that about the partnership with BCA, with Boeing Commercial Airplanes, really has been improving over time because you guys have throughput levels that, you know, even though Airbus may be producing more of those airplanes, they're doing it in multiple facilities. You're doing it from one facility, one facility. Uh, they they, and they have four. Um, you know, what are some of the some of the lessons you've learned over time over production, over the keys of making sure that this goes smoothly, and you know, sort of the rules you live by. And also, what are some of the lessons that your defense compatriots can learn? Because these are very sophisticated products that are going to be carrying millions of people at reliability rates that are higher than military products, and and basically very very narrow servicing band. Because when this airplane is not flying, it's not creating revenue. Yeah. I, uh, you're seeing some of the some of the lessons learned uh, with the announcement here that we made last week with uh, Ray Connor's retirement and the new organizational structure that surrounds him now. Uh, the new uh, materials management organization, supplier management that Stan Deal will um, run is across the enterprise, and that's one of the things that we are trying to leverage is is that shared responsibility and ownership that has been in the past it's been split between a defense and space and a commercial application now how do we get the suppliers that are common on both Honeywell or uh, people like that uh, UTI Rockwell Rockwell for example how do we leverage them and, and they have looked at us in the past about two different companies and and we act like two different companies and now today we're starting to make the steps to combine our organization, leverage some of these guys that are making uh, larger uh, profits than we are uh, and uh, get them to where we want uh, to have reliable, repeatable, high quality products at a price that you know is affordable for us. And what are some of the most important lessons you've learned over your career that you use every day? I think it's, for me, it's about relationships. I've, I've learned it very late in my career about how relationships matter uh, and getting things done uh, quicker uh, is really through the relationships. It's not only internal to the 737 program, it's enterprise wide and it's industry wide as well. And so I would say that was one of the things that came to me was about building, establishing, nurturing relationships. Marty, thanks very much for hosting us here. We really appreciate it. Welcome, my pleasure.